It's a mean world out there. And it's a mean rage. Let's change the culture. Let's change the way we think about this world. Let's have a hell of a time doing it. Welcome to Mean Age Daydream, a home for comedy, a home for some politics, and a daydream of a world that doesn't suck. I'm Brian McWilliams. Welcome to this man world. Welcome, everybody. Hope you're having a fantastic time diddling whatever you diddle. Welcome to Mean Age Daydream, a place for hating with positivity and, of course, laughing at the madness around us. So, yeah, welcome to the show, everybody. I am Brian McWilliams, as always, and I'd like to thank you for joining me. I, uh, As many of you know, or maybe you don't know, depends on if you listen to the last episode, I have recently had a, uh, a new child, and as such... I have been uh, doing some heavy reflecting on, I guess, the way of the world, you know, uh, how the future would look. I discussed last episode about the fears I have about climate change and uh, (laughs) not so much about climate change itself, but about the monstrous and, frankly, uh, inhumane actions taken on behalf of the climate cultists, of the globalists that want to crack down on fossil fuels and how this is all bleeding into an authoritarian future, a war on humanity, and even extending into a war on currency. And I'm actually, I think I might reach out to uh, to this one podcast over at uh, Co- the Coin Bureau, which Howie, uh, of course, had shared with us during our news links. But it was an interesting perspective about how the war on climate is also a war on cryptocurrencies because, of course, the Biden administration had made a call to all of their organizations under the big Biden banner of confusion and senility, asking them to submit their I guess, suggestions, concerns about crypto. And the very first one to step up to the plate was the science and technology arm, which had submitted a paper calling for regulation of crypto mining based upon climate justice. Yes. So now... We've got attacks on crypto, and now this all ties into ESG as well, uh, because you could argue that, well, why would any of these larger institutions invest in cryptocurrencies if they're not ESG compatible, right? Because if if you're fighting for climate justice, well, you can't be mining crypto because that could create pollution for the environment. There's carbon and electricity usage to mine cryptocurrencies, yada, yada, you get where I'm going. So I may do an episode about that uh, once the, uh, the fog clears, the fog of baby war that I'm currently in clears out of the way. And uh, speaking of, yes, you may notice I, I am still tired. I got, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going on about three to four hours less sleep than I usually get every day. So uh, since the, the baby came on the 8th, or actually the baby came on the 9th. And uh, I'll tell you, when I can get the sleep, it is highly advantageous. And as such, I want to tell you about a sponsor for our show today, which is Galactera and their cannabinoid-based tinctures and gummy products, of which I am a big fan. Obviously, I'm lying awake at night. I'm thinking about the climate future. I'm thinking about the ways in which my means of existence are being attacked. I'm thinking about the poor folks over in Germany, which now have had a 1,200% increase in their gas bills and a canceled contract. On uh, my Good Morning Fuckhead rant today, which, of course, is behind the Patreon wall, you might have heard me talk about how the uh, there was a bakery in Germany. They canceled the contract, right? So no longer do they get gas for their furnaces and also gave them a 330,000 euro bill. <laughs> so these poor people in Germany need Galactera's gummies to fall asleep, help you fall asleep with these wonderful, tasty gummies, and you will sleep uh, sleep soundly. Your fears of the cops kicking in your door because you dared to process raw milk and sell it. The fears of them coming after your guns and your wives and your drugs and everything else. Sleep them away with Galactera gummies. And guys, you can use a promo code of LIONS, L-I-O-N-S, to get 30% off your order. That's across the board. Anything, any amount, 30% off with promo code LIONS. So check out Galactera, G-A-L-A-C-T-E-R-R-A.com, Galactera.com forward slash, or I'm sorry, uh, look at the gummies, promo code LIONS. And these are uh, libertarians, by the way, that run this company. So you are supporting the cause, getting some good sleep, and also helping for a uh, libertarian company to get ahead. So 
Yes. Back to the situation we find ourselves in here. You know, I'm thinking about the future. I'm thinking about everything that's concerning me. And I'm, as you know, I, one of the things I'm trying to do with the show is to be positive and to paint the future as we would want to see it, right? I'm a libertarian. For those of you that may maybe just be coming and listening to the show here and there and everywhere, I am a libertarian. I believe in the free market philosophy. I believe in absolute personal freedom. Now that people get confused, personal freedom doesn't mean freedom uh, to do whatever you want at any given time, because obviously we can't be harming other people. Our freedoms cannot over uh, run. They cannot supersede the freedoms of another individual or cause them harm. But I think that moving forward, we need to paint the picture of what can be promised, what can be delivered under a libertarian perspective. And one of the things that I'm thinking about is I've got my two and a half year old girl, I've got my wife, uh, you know, I've got my, my business and I've got this new baby, is the way in which family dynamics play out in the world that we live in. How the libertarian philosophy is by far, uh, and, and I think by far and away, the absolute most defensive in regards to protecting family dynamics. It has the most to, to deliver. It has the best promise for keeping a family intact, for fostering family relations, for community relations, and it's not even close. I mean, I would argue clearly progressivism is the <laughs> is designed to break down the family unit. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. And conservatism, sure. I mean, I guess you can have conservatism in, in a way and say that that defends family values because there is emphasis on church. There is emphasis on, on keeping the units together. But at the same time, we've seen throughout time that conservatism also has issues in you can be ostracized from a family unit for breaking a taboo that's that's held within a church or t breaking a taboo that's held within uh, how you might view yourself and your sexuality, um, using a substance that is disapproved of within a conservative values community. Where in libertarianism, we're all choose, you know, we can all choose to set our, our own moral values and moral structures, but you don't have these kind of died, you know, passed down generation to generation biases against certain people, certain lifestyles that do still threaten to break up family units and then ostracize people from one side to another side because you don't have necessarily a free flow of ideas and a free flow of acceptance of different people, different lifestyles, and different viewpoints. So moving forward, why do I think that libertarianism delivers the biggest promise for family values? Well, as I said, Libertarianism at its core is about freedom, about personal responsibility, and not on dependency of government or looking for some larger uh, state entity to deliver your goods, your services, your protection, your child care, your education, etc. And what we've seen over the past 50, 70 years, you know, basically ever since ever since government has come into existence, more or less but with an accelerating speed over the past 50 years, is the government attacking the family unit? Now you think about how this breaks down and it's a, a variety of ways I'll go through real quick. Number one, you know, first and foremost, we've got the attack on the family unit in regards to how the government will take care of all of your needs. And I, when I say take care of, of course, I mean barely take care of anything, put you through the ringer, make you go and, and uh, you know, line up in a queue with all the other slave chattel and then punish you if you don't comply in every possible way. But putting a nanny state in place has both the function of creating people that are purely reliant on the state and we see that already half of America is getting some sort of, not welfare per se, but some sort of government assistance. That is an incentivized system in which they want to enlarge government. They want to pull people from depending on community and family to depending solely on the government and looking for the government to be its provider for all things. So that's one aspect, right? The second thing that I just you know, like alluded to is when you have a government that provides all of these services, you know, you've got your food stamps, you've got your uh, your money for loans if you need it, you've got your PPP loans during COVID, you've got welfare checks that go out to keep you from being kicked out of your house, you've got moratoriums on people getting kicked out for uh, for not paying their rent, you've got in California protections upon protections for people that are homeless or destitute that have basically thrown their lives away by choice or not, that don't want help, and a lot of people here do not want help, but they have given them the means to exist outside of a need for any family or any background. This is by design. 
This is by design to erode the family because if the government can erode the family unit, if they can get people split off, number one, you're no longer having cultural values passed down. That means that the government can rewrite cultural values based upon a whim, based upon the moment, and based upon the needs of the elites that are in charge of that government. So think about that, how we've seen this play out. Think about how we've seen the government narrative change so many times in so many different, very strongly held cultural beliefs, and they continue to rewrite it and intentionally push diverse topics that do break up family unions. You see this echoed in the news media as well. The most divisive topics are always the things pushed at the forefront because they know this is going to keep people at each other's throats. This is going to break down family units. We saw this with Trump. We see it with climate change. We see it with abortion and every other topic where you literally have families breaking up over these topics. But getting back to government subsistence, when you have a government entity now that says, well, look, you don't want to live with mom and dad anymore. Well, good news. We are going to provide you with a form of universal basic income, AKA welfare. They're talking about more forms of universal basic income. They've already seen this play out in certain states that are testing it out in certain countries across the globe. We're going to enable you to exist outside of that family unit. And they will tell you this is all because these people need support because we would be cruel and unusual people, horrible people. If we didn't pick somebody up that was kicked out, let's say, for example, this is something that goes underreported because people just don't want to talk about it because you can't talk about these things in Los Angeles or any other progressive city. But a high number of people that are in Hispanic or black families actually do get kicked out because they tend to come out as gay or transsexual or whatever it might be. All right. Something that doesn't fit into the cultural norm within that that specific family group or societal group that they inhabit. So they end up homeless. They end up on the streets. Now, I agree there should be something there for these people. But when it's the government every time, well, that's what that becomes a problem for me. And when people know they can rely on the government for all these things, then it's incentivizing them to take the leap. Now, in the past, you looked at decades and decades and decades of this, centuries even, instead of having a government reliance, you would instead have groups and organizations that would support each other. For the longest time before gay marriage was accepted, you would have the underground communities of gay, you know, gay men, gay women, lesbians, all that stuff that would get together and they would have support groups that would take in people that were ostracized from family units. You also had in the past, you know, organizations that would take care of all your basic needs for medical care, let's say, if you were, again, tossed out of a family unit if you lost your job, but these were nonprofit charitable organizations, or these were trade union groups. You know, you'd get any trade union group from your work or a familial, a community would have the, uh, an agreement with a doctor outside of insurance, outside of government subsidized, outside of Medicare, outside of, you know, all of these other different services that the government forces down our throats, ostensibly for the good of the people. But again, these were not goods that needed to be provided because they already existed within community and family groups. So we've got an incentive for people to leave the nest, to not have to depend on family. So you've got family units that are being eroded. You've got family units that now also have a system which typically most families do put their children into public schooling. So what happens in public schooling? Well, I would argue another erosion of family values in exchange for governmental values. And this comes back around to, again, the ability to rewrite truth and redefine cultural and importance of the society at a, at a whim, because government schools are essentially institutions that are designed and they are designed to, the, to do this, by the way, taken from the Prussian model that was designed to create, quote unquote, good citizens. When I hear the phrase good citizens and the intent to create good citizens, I don't think that they have family values in mind. I think they have soldiers in mind, workers in mind. And of course, that is the truth. So you've got these large government institutions set up in regards to schooling that your kids are going to, to you know, for eight hours a day outside of the purview of the parents and with intent to keep many things secret. We've seen this play out with the trans movement. We see this play out with uh, you know sexual identities where schools are keeping the truth from parents. You could argue, and I've had this argument with friends, you could argue that, well, maybe the schools should keep them something secret. You know, if a child is, is uh, gay and is scared to come out to their parents because they're in a very conservative household, well, should the school counselor keep that to themselves? I, I can see that argument. I, I, I definitely can. But at the same time, on a counter argument, I was arguing with a friend about the transsexual movement and how if somebody is identifying as a different gender, 
and insisting by going out as a different name, a different identity in a school, that's where I do think a parent should be notified. Because that is also a symbol of an alteration to me that isn't simply a matter of sexual identity, but is a matter of gender identity. And that can go down a very dark path as we've seen, especially when you know that there are bad actors out there that will volunteer to give children, uh, you know, as young as 10, hormones straight outside of a doctor, outside of a family knowledge or family permission, and simply give children, you know, hormones that can alter them forever. So not having that knowledge shared is troubling, but these are the institutions that you're shipping kids off to every day. With the libertarian future that we're looking at, you have school choice. So maybe you still send your kid to the same school if you trust those people, but at least you have the ability to weigh what that school is delivering. With school choice, as promised by you know either a voucher system again voucher system still depends on taxation which i'm not for obviously <laughs> the libertarian future would also have a complete erosion of the uh, the ability of the government to tax things but let's say there is a tax base let's say that the tax base exists for the community that that uh, your property inhabits they still are property taxes but you get the voucher system at least that's a step forward into accountability and to be able to, to choose what you want for your child and maybe that comes down to cultural values maybe that comes down to uh educational values and a specific uh, type of education you want, be it focused on mathematics more, be it focused on the arts more. And you do see that compatibility in some states, Arizona notably, Texas notably. Um, California has an aspect of that with charter schools where you can have these kids. And of course, there are also private schools, but they cost an arm and a leg to send your kids to. But when you have the opportunity to freely choose what education your child has and also have oversight into what's going on and never forget by the way the absolute fight that teachers unions have put up over parents demanding to know what's being taught on the curriculum you have teachers going viral on TikTok saying well i shouldn't have to defend or share the curriculum that i want to teach with parents what i'm sorry what what are you talking about of course you should of course you have to share what's being taught in the classroom with the parents that are sending children to said classroom. But there's also, of course, the aspect of homeschooling. You talk about keeping a family unit intact. Homeschooling is one of the keys to doing that as well, because you now have developed a dynamic in which the kid is staying within the household. You have a strong family bond. You're now passing down shared education and training the child, not just in the government mandated check boxes of what has to be passed along in order to move the society forward and create good citizens. But you're also able to teach other things that are more involved with life lessons, life experiences, everyday worldview getting along within the context of going shopping, going to the store, interacting with neighbors, taking care of house chores, learning how to do taxes. I mean, these are all types of things that you wouldn't necessarily do in a standard educational environment. And I know there's not an ability for everybody to do that. I can't do it. My wife and I don't have the ability to homeschool because it's just frankly too expensive in Los Angeles to do that. We have to pay the bills. But as we'll see a little bit later, the promise of a libertarian philosophy and economic model also will open up that possibility a little bit more. Now, I want to circle back again on you know this non-reliance on government and how that helps family units. Because I've talked about the different incentives to pulling people away from a family unit as provided by the government. But let's not you know, let's also talk about how the government has attacked family units through things like the drug war, right? That first and foremost has to be one of the most detrimental actions governments have ever taken, really any form of prohibition, because you're policing a voluntary action, right? No one's forcing you, like a certain sex, sex traffickers are forcing uh, ladies and, and young boys to shoot up heroin, but that's a different topic for a different day. A voluntary action, most often nonviolent, or the violence that comes from the drug war is typically because of the prohibition created. These are drug gangs that are fighting for turf or are murdering in order to obtain more power within the context of the drug war, an illicit operation that has to be taken underground by force of government. But the drug war, by design, seems to have targeted more than anything else minority families. And you know this in the way it plays out with court cases. I've said before, white privilege is a thing to a certain degree, and it comes out really predominantly with the drug war. White kids do not go to jail anywhere near as often as black kids or Hispanic kids when it comes to drug offenses. 
And then when you're in that prison system, right, they're over policing, over policing communities. You've got kids that are disincentivized from going to school, right? You know, because not only is the, the school providing this education system, but at the same time, they're also providing incentives for kids not to show up. And I talked about this in another episode as well, but there's now incentives in place, specifically race-based incentives for black people, specifically black people, to not have to go to school because they put in, and I believe this is in New York state, they put in a measure that said, you cannot punish people for not doing their homework, for coming in truancy, for missing school, for being violent, et cetera. Only if you're black. Though. So incentivizing kids to miss school, what do you think they're gonna do if they're coming from a poorer environment? They're not necessarily gonna go out and get a nine to five you know, job during school because they know, okay, if I get a job at Quickie Mart down the street here and somebody walks in that's a cop, they're gonna see I'm not in school. I could get in trouble for truancy. Well, not get in trouble, I guess, for truancy. But the clearer path, the more frankly, monetarily rewarding path is going to be to deal drugs, get involved with, with crime. So you have incentivization on both sides, right? In the meantime, while you've got this burgeoning environment of violence, of crime, and, uh, and of drug sales, you're over-policing it because they know the incentive structure set up that people are going to be partaking in this. So they now attack. They now put extra cops in there. They're now breaking up families. They're putting kids in jail. They're putting adults in jail. Thanks to the progressives of the, uh, the Clinton era and including Joe Biden support, you had the three strike rule put into place in which nonviolent drug offenders could go away for life. So you've got a system set up where you are targeting more or less minority populations, breaking up family units and causing them to never, never get back together because you have the welfare apparatus set up that pays more for families to stay broken up, pays more for more children to be in the families and for the parents, for specifically the fathers to not come back and join that system. And then on top of that, because of the drug war, well, now you've got this other incentive for people to not work because they don't want to lose their welfare. They're basically basically now subservient to the system, living in this gilded cage that's been created, you know, a gilded page with the filthiest newspaper on the, the floor of it, by the way, that you've ever seen. And now you get people who are living at home. They're not going to work. They're living off welfare, but still drinking, doing drugs. And now you've got the CPS. Child Protective Services gets involved. So now you have a massive foster population of children that are the result of government action, of the destructive actions of government specifically designed to destroy families, to create serfs and slaves who are dependent on the government. And now it's cyclical, right? Now these children coming out of foster care, statistically, some like 70% of children coming out, or, or I'm sorry, of the prison system spend time in foster care. Think about that. And I work with I work with foster organizations. It's, it's part of my job. You've got tens of thousands in, San, in, in California, actually in Los Angeles, we have 35 to 38,000 foster kids at any given time, just in this county, just in this county, 70% of which are going to spend time in the penal system. Why? More often than not, thieving, you know, uh, drug abuse, prostitution, sex trafficking, this is what these, these premises that the government creates is, uh, this is what's being created. This is what the attack on family units is resulting in. And these people now are going to be perpetuating the cycle. If they live to adulthood, if they stay out of prison, well, they're probably still going to be involved in creating more broken family units. And that perpetuates itself. The black community back in the 1920s, 1940s had actually higher family coherency rates than white communities until progressive policies got involved, until all these welfare actions, until all these promises and incentives and drugs were introduced, thanks Ronald Reagan, to destroy communities of color. But it's not just communities of color, as I said. It's about breaking down family units overall. I'm kind of going here and there. I've got a, a ton of other, uh, again, I've got all these different bullet points. For instance, another way in which the government is, is subsidizing and encouraging a breakup of family units is to support divorce. I mean, to talk about, to basically talk up independent single motherhood as a, a benefit to attack your, uh, you know, your, your obligations to children, to make it easier than ever, I guess, to live conscience free in regards to child rearing. And this again is, in my opinion, by intent because you have weaker family units. You now have limited upward mobility because a coherent family unit is the number one way in which you can get ahead economically, the stability. And like I was talking about earlier, 
the ability to provide support for somebody if things go wrong, right? And I'll, I'll circle back around to that again. But these, all these things are, are, are attacks on family that are very intentional. Because self-reliance, as a family, as a person, self-reliance is a gift. I mean, it, it is not only a gift that you give to yourself, but also give to your family because you're teaching them the values to realize and understand risk reward. And as a family unit, you know, going out through the centuries, risk reward was there to, to move, to undertake a new business, to undertake a new investment, to do anything involved risk reward. And when you have a family there, you know, it's not just about you and your own gamble. You're now gambling on everything you're giving on the future of your family, your house, your line, et cetera. But that is a gift to be able to have that. And it's a bond because when you talk about going through something as a family, a hard time, a good time, you're now still keeping that family unit closer than ever because you're learning how to operate. You're learning how to exist outside of a safety net other than the one you've provided and other than the one that you've fostered with community and family, friends around you and, and within maybe, you know, a generation of blood. If the government can break that down, if they can break up these units, well, then that's again, where you have people solely relying on government because you don't have community. And that's where the divisive nature of news, the divisive nature of government policy. So the way politics are played out, this two party system of red versus blue and hating the other politicians. And that's where we're at right now. Hating, not a cold respect, not a, a mutual disinterest, or at least, you know, okay, you go, you're over there. I'm over here. Well, you know, we can get along. No, it, it's intentionally fostered this hatred that benefits only one category of people, and that is the people in power in politics. Because again, every political speech, vitriol, hatred, attacking, everything is the end of days at all times. When in reality, in reality, you look around you and none of it is the end of days, realistically. But you would be led to believe that you have to be in panic and attack mode at all times. And having that fear response is so much easier if you don't have a family around you, a community to talk to to go down to your neighbor and say, hey, what's this shit? You know, heard about this, what's going on? To calmly discuss topics rather than be inflamed at all times. And your family defines much of what you view as the truth and the reality of your situation, right? I mean, just look to religion. I'm not a religious person, right? I enjoyed, uh, you know, John Odermatt, who now is, of course, a Finding Freedom, our Monday show. I'm still here on Wednesdays. John did a whole episode that I was listening to. It's pretty interesting about exorcism, right? John, he's, he's a, a Christian. He is very religious as far as uh, things go, but I'm not. But yet John and I are very good friends. Uh, I have no qualms in listening to this perspective from a religious show, but his reality and understanding of the world, understanding of uh, the truth and moral truths definitely revolves around his upbringing, his family, his current family, his extended family and community of church. Whereas my family, we're still all very close and we've never been too religious. My mother was, so maybe I've got that Catholic background of morality within me, but still our family unit's intact. And my parents and I talk every week and we talk about what's going on in the world. And again, we will, through conversation, come to a conclusion about the reality of our world and the values in which we want to perpetuate, we want to pass along to our children, and that we want to simply confer by our very being and our actions. And that's something that, again, the government wants to take away. They want to take away that perspective on truth. And you see that through actions on social media with governments working with Facebook and Twitter to obfuscate or censor data and information coming out to censor viewpoints, working with the mainstream media hand in hand, seeing CIA members and members of the Department of, uh, of State now going to work for the major news organizations, the rotating door between presidential cabinets and presidential press secretaries and the media. It's nonstop because they want to alter and control your perception of truth. And more often than not, your perception of truth, what you trust, comes from your family because you've learned through the years that you've been together that you can trust family. An erosion of that trust by government to make government the only narrative, the only source for definitive truth, which is what they're trying to do right now, can benefit no one but government. 
And it definitively does not help the family because now you're going to have two different realities that present themselves clashing at all times when you're at the dinner table, when you're getting together for Thanksgiving dinner. That one is the mainstream media government narrative that they want you to believe, that they want you to tell, that they want you to fight for as a good citizen and hammer it into your brain, which is why you see so much cognitive dissonance with people. That's why you see it because they're being inundated and hammered with government authoritarianism, with government narratives, with one solo truth. And then when they're presented with another truth that blows that one truth out of the water, they cannot understand it. Family creates a reality that you can use as a basis of comparison at the very least, which again is why they're trying to destroy. Oh, I skipped over, I was talking about self-reliance and also just, you know, people going out on their own. Ah, see, I'm going all over here. I'll stick to the, I'll, I'll stick to the moral values and, and family values here. But the other thing too, I talked about earlier how the government wants to create its own cultural morality and change it at a whim. And this ties into military industrial complex. This ties into global hege uh, hegemony, hegemony. There we go. Got it right the second time around. It ties into very much the 1984 defining of how you must see the world, what you must view as good and evil and your family values. As I was talking about, you know, talking about religion, your family values pass a lot of that along. Now, libertarianism doesn't have a specific morality to it that I would say other than, you know, the, the very fine uh, phrase, uh, don't, you know, don't hurt people. Don't take their stuff. I think, uh, Matt Kibbe over at, uh, the, uh, oh my God, I'm just playing the name of his, of his corporation. Oh my God. Oh, sorry, Kibby. <laughs> totally blanking on it. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Um, but, you know, they, they have merch with that, uh, that phrase on it. And uh, outside of that, you know, it's pretty much the non-aggression principle. But when it comes to your moral perspective on different sexualities of, of different ways in which the world and people should interact, do business, I mean, it flows from that one source. But outside of that, it comes from your family values. You know, the the simple stuff of not hurting people, of not taking things that aren't yours, of treating people well. Um, this can be a, a benefit and a curse granted, depending on the family unit. But I have to believe that as family units become more entrenched once again, when you have people that are now living within the context of understanding of non-divisive media narratives of uh, non-divisive schooling narratives of non-divisive uh, ways in which that the family dynamics exist where you're not constantly under pressures from government or the states or the police to live your life a specific way you're going to have more opportunity to get back to cultural norms and have a more standard family unit that's going to be successful um going back to i guess a, a safety net of sorts People will attack libertarianism because they'll say, well, you're very selfish. You don't want to provide anything for people that are hurting or, uh, or out in the world and don't have it. And I, and I alluded to this earlier, talking about welfare state and incentivizing people to leave. But I did want to circle back to it because when you have a family unit that's intact, you have somewhere that people can always go. And you additionally have within the future I'd like to, to present you have more opportunity to keep and live within the family uh, dream of, I guess, the American future, right? The promised future of two cars and a house and a picket fence and, and property that you can actually own and live on and foster, and they're not going to take it away from you. And I think that that future is only possible through a libertarian philosophy, uh, economically and philosophically, because right now we're presented with skyrocketing inflation. That makes it almost impossible for people to really save effectively. It makes it almost impossible for people to budget as far as clothing, food, gasoline, energy. And again, going back to energy and the crisis that all these families find themselves in because of bad actors within the global community dependent on changing things based upon projections of climate scientists who have been proven wrong with every existing model and putting all their eggs in one basket to the detriment of the broader population. So, you know, reining in the ability of government to control the monetary supply, reining in the ability of government to tax your property, reining in the ability to take your property away from you should you be delinquent by $5 and 30 days on a property tax bill, of which there are many examples. Fighting back against the government's ability to come in 
and regulate your business out of existence or freeze your assets for no good reason or to limit where you can and can't sell your product, how you can and can't market your product. All of these things lead to an erosion of your ability to create money, to create value, to save money and believe in that value going forward. And that's really, I think, one of the cores too. When we talk about family now, we talk about how families coming into existence, people having children has been moved backwards by five, 10 years. People used to have children very young. They'd get married, they'd buy a house, they'd have kids very young. And now you just don't see that. Why? Because of uncertainty. There is an uncertainty principle that is baked into having a family now in more markets than not, in more states and cities than not, because of the uncertainty of the promise of value when it comes to currency, success, career, the housing market, the stability of, of goods and services. All of these things are tied into government power, government control, monopolies on what and what cannot be done. And you have to think, that if we could rein that in, the promise of the American dream could once again become resurgent. And that dream existed fairly strongly up until recent times when the inflationary marketplace pushed things so far out of whack, combining with again red tape and when you, what you can build, what you have to build, the welfare state coming in and insisting that people that buy in a certain area have to pay for a certain amount of, uh, of property that goes to the poorest among us, that people that are building apartment complexes or condo complexes that would take pressure off of houses have to put in a certain amount of low income housing or basically giving away their product at subpar or substandard levels to benefit these poor people, but then disincentivizes developers from building these buildings so they don't get built. And so houses cost more. This is all a spiral created by government. And, if, and again, in the, in the future where we look to libertarianism and philosophies reigning in, economic practices reigning in the inflationary amounts that, that erode people's savings, that make it impossible to save and incentivize people to throw into to gamble on the stock market instead. Well, if you rein that in, if you rein in the ability uh, of government to regulate what you can build, if you open up the housing costs, if you open up the market, if you make it easier and take a licensing aspect a lot from what people want to do as far as obtaining and building their own houses, building smaller houses, getting property, opening businesses that, that, they, that can create value for themselves and their families to buy a house. All of these things, again, are tied into government. And by shrinking the size of government and the economic power and the regulatory power of government, we can see a resurgence in family and resurgence of that American dream. All right, next thing I wanted to talk about, uh, let's say I already talked, I'm checking them off. I have a list here again. You know, this is a topic I've been thinking about, so it's a little bit rough. And, and again, this is something where I'm keeping these as uh, to flesh out further in the book I'm working on, which I believe is going to be called Dreams and Resentment. So, oh, how about this one? Again, I talked about upward mobility. The government is the primary function, uh, is the primary uh, villain in stopping upward family mobility. And you think about the different ways in which this, this is enacted. Number one, I told you, breaking up family units, the drug war, uh, overactive, you know, vir virtually any nonviolent crime shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't need, necessarily need to be going sent away to prison or removed from your family. Uh, child protective services being highly aggressive and very little culpability or, or, uh, or responsibility of oversight with these organizations that come in at a whim to take away people's kids that will come and literally knock on your door if your kid is unattended in a, in a uh, playground. So CPS involved in breaking up family units. Um, and also just the, I guess the cultural removal of any onus of responsibility for staying within a marital contract. And not the, I'm not saying that people should stay in a marital contract. I'm not saying that that's always the best move. Clearly, sometimes it isn't, and people can remarry, move on, and do whatever. I know plenty of people that have. But I still think that there is definitely an emphasis on, hey, no harm, no foul, break up, move along, it's no big deal. Look, we've got an entire family court system set up to help you move along here. And, uh, and you know, it's all good, baby. Go live your life. Go fuck whoever you want to fuck. But, you know, the threats of violence, let's say over taxation issues. Um, if you don't pay your taxes, we're going to put you in jail. 
If you don't pay your property taxes, we're going to take your house. If you let your kids out to play, we're going to take your kids. I mean, these are all threats of violence. These are threats of an intimidation held over your head by governments at all times that impact family coherency and that in exchange impact upward social mobility. Because if you don't have the family unit, if you don't have that ability to keep together, to weather the storm, and also to beneficially pass on income, pass on inheritance, pass on accrued wealth, which the government also wants to attack, right? Because don't forget the inheritance tax exists. Uh, you know, you could give a, some, you could give a certain amount of money as a gift up to a certain amount, then that gets taxed. These are all estate taxes. These are all taxes to erode the ability for you to keep your family intact, to keep your family uh, wealth intact, and to foster a new generation of people that can then use that money to keep their own families intact. Again, intentionally eroding out the system. They'll tell you it's to benefit other people that are the poorer among us. Again, this is the argument that libertarianism is selfish, but it is not because when you understand these systems are not designed to help, but are designed to erode, to help and create a new generation, or I'm sorry, they're designed to help create a new generation of people dependent on the government with no intention on keeping them upwardly social mobile and simply to keep them basically on the dole, sucking the teat and in a unified block of people that want the handout, you understand that this is an evil and not a good the government is perpetuating on the citizens. Keeping wealth in a family that has been hard earned, passing that along to another generation is a good thing. People creating new businesses, having stability within a community is a good thing. People that have money coming from different sources that are stable are the most likely to give to charity, to benefit their community, to give back, to be able to live their lives in a sustainable manner, and that's good for everybody. Trying to put people back at step one, just for the sake that everybody should be equal, does not help to do anything except foster more poverty, more people that are living in desperate situations, and more people that are going to be looking around. And again, like I said, have no concept of what the stability that we again the the value proposition of of the standard of living that we that we expect in america or any civilized country let's say is that you can keep on going at an even keel without too much inflation without too much flux in how businesses operate in the how the economy is chugging along and naturally there's going to be some but we know that these are dependent on government bubbles, on government infusions of cash. Every great recession has more or less been caused by a government, and every great recovery has not. It's usually been spurred along by technological innovation. Passing along that money, giving people stability, giving people a chance, and having them a, giving them a cushion to be able to experiment and try something new, be it entrepreneurial, be it technological, having a house where a kid can crash for a couple of weeks or a couple of months or a couple of years even, not that I'd say that's the best thing, until they find their bearings and get their feet, is a good thing for society. And the government continuously tries to erode that ability. All right, last thing, uh, let's see, I talked about that. Economics of saving and confidence of value, check that out. Oh, family business. So I want to talk about family businesses as well, right? And I think that when you've got family businesses that have uh, seemingly a thing of the past now, you, you just, you don't hear a lot about family businesses surviving. And I think that this, again, I will point the finger back at government. And I think it's a shame. I think it's, I, I think it's a real, I don't know. It's almost like something out of a, a sad, sad movie. You know, we're old Giuseppe in the pizza parlor, or, uh, the, you know, the guy who's the tinker in his shoes no longer has a son that either wants to take over the family business or can't compete anymore because they've been put out of business by large government institutions. You look at what is happening right now over in UK. Uh, you look at what's happened over COVID. You look about uh, what's happening in, oh God, where is it? It's in, uh, yeah, Germany. Germany, and I'll use this example of the bakery again. The German bakery that is now essentially being forced to close because they can't get gas. They've been issued this $330,000 gas bill and had a contract canceled. In theory, the government is going to provide them a bailout because they said, oh, we have, we have $45 billion and we will uh, gladly help the peoples. But they don't because the $45 billion they set aside doesn't apply to craft businesses, AKA small businesses. What sense does that make? Who's getting the money then? Oh, the bigger businesses. 
That's right. These bailouts are for the larger corporations. They don't want small business to succeed. They don't want small businesses, as much as they talk about it, as much as they, they create these bullshit loan programs for small businesses, they don't want small businesses really to succeed because big government and big corporations love working hand in hand. I discussed the regulatory environment earlier. Again, regulatory environment gives large, large corporations the biggest benefit of the doubt. It gives government the most sway. They can claim they created jobs. They can claim they created econ economic incentives. They can claim X, Y, and Z. And in the meantime, the corporations are able to force out small businesses, force out competition, and most notably, force out potential uh, suitors that could technologically or operatingly upset the way in which the entire system works, right? Which is a good thing. Again, you need to have that that variety. You need to have variety in everything in life. And right now, what we're looking at is an emphasis, government emphasis pushed on down on people essentially operating in lockstep, right? They want to create automatons. They want everything to keep in the same model. And disruption is the enemy of government. Any sort of disruption economic disruption, cultural disruption, educational disruption, which is why they're fighting so hard with these unions when it comes to education against voucher systems, against charter schools, against school choice, against home homeschooling, which is why you see them fighting with the large corporations against anybody trying to upset in the medical field and provide a new way to inject, you know, uh, uh, what's the uh, uh, insulin, which is why you see them attacking and big pharma working hand in hand in government to make it almost impossible to get anything through the FDA for under $20 million cost because that keeps out smaller competitors that could actually upset the paradigm and introduce new technologies to the marketplace. They don't want disruption in this environment. And that comes as well with in my opinion, now hear me, I don't know, I'm talking about how they don't want disruption. Well, families, Brian, families have been around forever. Wouldn't it be disrupting to break up the family unit? No. What's disrupting at this point in time is to keep the family unit in place. Because as I've said, the disruption comes from people in the family unit talking amongst themselves, coming to their own conclusions, finding out new ways to work. And many times you'll have, again, family businesses, you'll have family units that find unique ways to look at the world, to work, to operate, to communicate, to go out in there and, and, and decide how they want to live their lives in a free environment. And the government cannot have that cannot have that outlier or the potential for the outlier to exist. Just again, why libertarianism is the only philosophy that promises a true return to family values, to family freedoms, and the future of family units to upwardly mobile, mobilize, <laughs> upwardly mobilize to make themselves better, to make the communities better, to foster an environment where in which they can keep their money and pass that through to next generations to then create more wealth, more businesses, more opportunity for everybody while maintaining their values, maintaining their understanding of reality, the truth around them and everything else that's good in the world. That was a long rant, I know, but like I said, I wanted to do an episode on this topic and I have done it. Um, guys, by the way, support us. I want to talk about one more thing. One more little funny thing, uh, but support us if you would share the show, please, guys. I beg of you, please share the show, retweet it, tell a friend, uh, give us a review on iTunes if you haven't. We really, really could use some more reviews on iTunes, not only for Mean Age Daydream, right, which is my solo, uh, I have a solo feed for this show as well as being on the Lions of Liberty Network. And uh, don't forget, by the way, we aired a special uh robbie robbie the fire bernstein and i of part of the problem and of course the run your mouth podcast we have done two episodes now of hate watch watching hillary clinton and chelsea clinton's gutsy uh the worst show i've ever seen in my entire life but we're hate watching it so that's that's what we want but i aired the first breakdown we did last friday i will air the second breakdown again this coming friday but only on the lions of liberty network so Make sure you subscribe to that feed. Again, if you'd be so kind on Spotify, on Apple, on iTunes, give us a five-star review and a little bit of a write-up. That would be awesome. Uh, really help the show, especially Mean Age Dangers. I'm trying to get, grow the solo feed outside of the, uh, the network. Again, we're trying to get more people in in a little bit more non-traditional manner and share the show. Please like, subscribe, tell people, share. Support us on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Lions of Liberty. You get my Good Morning Fuckhead rant. 
tomorrow. We're doing a live stream recording of uh, our new conspiracy show, uh, which is going to be focused on Epstein and other things. Uh, should be a good one. Not, and outside of what we already talked about, don't worry, it's not going way back to the other stuff. It's going to be some new stuff here. But that's going to be called uh, Lies, Secrets, Lies, and Cover Ups, SLC. Secrets, Lies, and Cover Ups. So we're doing a live recording of that tomorrow at 9 p.m. We're going to stream that live to our Facebook group and, uh, and up in the Patreon and also on Locals, lionsoflibertylocals.com. So get in there, support the show, and uh, you know, go buy an awesome T-shirt. We got a bunch of them. Okay, wrapping up this episode. I was going through Twitter. You know, I'm opening up. I'm on the shitter, and I'm looking at, uh, at my Twitter, and I couldn't help but shake my head in awe because Tim Allen was trending and I'm like, all right, what, you know, what's Tim Allen trending for? Is he, is, are they making another toy story? Are they making Buzz Lightyear too? And they intelligently put Tim Allen back in, you know, instead of uh fucking Chris, whatever his face was, captain, captain progressive America. Now he's trending because he tweeted and I'll read you the exact tweet. He tweeted out a joke about Joe Biden, and it's not an especially funny joke. It's not an especially clever joke. It's a pretty much standard joke. It's what you would expect to hear from almost any late night comedian that wasn't a complete sellout hack. Here's the joke. Biden was on 60 Minutes. I heard he asked how long the show was. But um bum pa as of, as of right now, it's got 12 and a half thousand retweets. 2,300 quote tweets and 105,000 uh, likes. So pretty good, right? Pretty good for this tweet, which again is a joke any comedian could have written in their sleep. But really what I would have expected, you know, a Jimmy Kimmel, right? Or what a Jay Leno probably would have said, what a Johnny Carson would have said, what a David Letterman would have said, probably even you know, a Conan O'Brien would have said because they weren't sellout fucking hacks. But now we have the left, which had owned comedy for a long time, right? The left still thinks that they own comedy. And I've said this a million times now, the left has lost the lead. They've, they've completely lost the beat on what is funny and what's not gonna be because they can't take a joke anymore. And as I discussed earlier too, the way in which the politics exists today, the way in which we're being taught to hate nonstop, we can no longer simply laugh at a joke that happens to be about our quote unquote guy. Right, because everybody's guy now is theirs, do or die. You have to defend this person, no matter how stupid and asinine they are. The right did it with Trump. The left does it with Biden. It's all fucking poison, man. But it sickened me that this joke had liberals up in arms. Progressives lost their fucking mind over that joke. That simple joke. And it's, again, it's not especially good, but it's funny enough. Set up punchline. The show's called 60 Minutes. Biden's so senile and dumb, he doesn't know what it is. Okay, man. Just laugh at it. It's a funny little setup. Just laugh it off. But they can't. The vitriol aimed at Tim Allen. People attacking his character. People attacking him, calling him washed up. Calling, calling, go back to jail, you coke addict. Blah, blah, blah. You would have thought that he made an ill-tempered joke about the Queen of England rotten in her grave with two fingers shoved up her snatch. That's what you would have thought that Tim Allen said. You would have thought that Tim Allen went after, I don't even know, you know, Bo, Bo Biden and said something horrible about the president's dead son, you know, LP New Hampshire style. No. Simple joke, funny little joke, lost their minds. That is so telling. Because it goes to show you now, these people will play into any bait provided. And this is what I, you know, from a strategic perspective, and I know these people aren't strategists, they're not messaging or communication strategists, but knowing that it's that easy, I mean, Trump broke them so badly where they had to respond to anything Trump said, they now have taken that Trump dementia, that, that knee jerk reaction that Trump provided, and now they've extended it to anyone in the sphere. Even if it's a stand-up comedian slash uh, former A-lister that's now, I don't know, a B-lister celebrity on TV. Because he didn't like their guy and made a simple joke about it, he's the demon, he's the enemy, they've got to jump on it, they've got to retweet it, they've got to amplify the fuck out of it, which is what happens every time these people just don't get it. You are working for 
the Tim Allen perspective here by by losing your mind and providing people the exact perspective that they read and they watch libs of TikTok for is this exact reaction. You got to love it, man. You got to love it. Anyway, good one, Tim Allen. That's going to do it for us, uh, us guys. Again, like, retweet, subscribe, share the show. It obviously, we're in a time of transition here. Uh, John and I are working on some other things. There is going to be a, uh, a Friday show that John and I are going to do. It's going to be a short format show. I'm going to uh, tease it now, but again, this is going to be only on the Lions of Liberty Network, so make sure you subscribe to the Lions of Liberty Network show. We're going to roll this out probably in about a week or two. we got to get our ducks in the row for it. You know, probably a little uh, theme song action going and, uh, and roll that out. But it's going to be a fun way to end your week focused more on just uh, funny stuff in the political. Otherwise, hugs and kisses from me, Brian McWilliams, the Lions of Liberty Network, and Mean Age Daydream. Keep those electric eyes on me, babe. Keep that ray gun to my head.